<clears throat> well, thank you very much uh, for showing up this morning, and thank you for inviting me to uh, speak at this conference. Uh, just so you know, uh, first off, this is not anything remotely <laughs> related to Shortly, um, but I give several talks on uh, dendrochronology and forest history, and I do forest history all over the United States. In fact, this is a re current project we have going on in um, uh, the, Sh the Shoshone National Forest of Wyoming. Uh, for research that's being conducted for the USDA Forest Service. Um, this is actually on white bark pine, so it's a white pine. But <clears throat> I first started working with shortleaf pine for my master's research, and this is going to date me, I know, but it's, uh, this is, I first cored my, uh, I cored my first shortleaf pine almost 30 years ago in 1986, and I've been uh, thankfully involved with this species for on and off for the last 30 years. I actually had to go out west to learn my trade here for dendrochronology. And uh, luckily, about 20 years ago, I came back to God's country here in the southeast. I didn't have to hide my southern accent anymore. Um, but <clears throat> and I, it's really good to be back here in the southeast, by the way. First off, let me give you a little definition here. Uh, every one of you has used tree rings at some point in your career, so this is, again, I'm preaching to the choir here, but I'm going to give you a little bit more information on how we use tree rings to learn about forest history with a specific reference to learning about fire and its, and its influence on shortleaf pine. So dendrochronology, as you see from the, from the root words here, tree, branch, dendro, uh, chronos, time, so the study <coughs> of time using trees or the study of trees over time, and applying that to some research question. And you'll see the research questions in just a minute, but the formal definition then for dendrochronology is the science that uses tree rings dated, and this is very important, dated to their exact year formation to analyze anything in time or anything across space, any type of process, including, for example, wildfire, in the physical and cultural sciences, as you heard in my introduction, I do a lot of historic structures because guess what? You find historic structures with tree rings and logs and they want to know where it was, this cabin indeed built by um, Abraham Lincoln's father in the year 1809, which it was not, by the way. So if it has tree rings, we're able to at least provide some information on, <clears throat> on the history of those things. But this is what dendrochronology is, exact year formation. There's no plus or minus whatsoever. We're using our techniques, we can assign the exact calendar year to any tree ring that we analyze. As far as applications are concerned, we're primarily concerned with disturbance processes. The big one that I'm going to talk about today is wildfire. I've been doing this for nearly 30 years, ever, ever since I went to uh, Tucson, Arizona to learn this in 1988. <clears throat> These dominate the types of studies being conducted here in the U.S. and in the last 15 years or so, especially here in the southeastern United States, essentially learning how to use tree rings to learn about past fire. Actually, we had to break the paradigm that, oh, well, fire was not that common here in the southeast, so your tree ring dating techniques are not going to work, and we just de debunked that. We also do analyze insect dynamics, populations, uh, outbreaks, for example of mostly defoliators. Uh, our big one now is, of course, the uh, emerald ash borer. We've done work with hemlock woolly and delgid as well. Uh, not so much with southern pine beetle. <clears throat> Tree health, uh, effects of uh, silvicultural management, various diseases, <clears throat> cankers, air, water, anything, anything that affects tree growth is going to be recorded by the tree and we can, and some, to some degree, help understand those processes over time. And of course, climate dynamics, which affect all trees, the overarching signal that affects all trees, both on the short term, such as a drought, or even on the long term, for example, the different oscillations. And of course, our friend El Nino will be coming back this winter, and that's one of the things that we can analyze using tree rings. At the same time, we're actually very much interested in understanding how this forest came to be. Especially, we will get tree establishment data. That's critical to what we do because when trees establish and the pattern of establishment over time is very indicative of what has affected that forest. Stand composition. We are very good, or have gotten very good at identifying different tree species and learning the changes in species composition over time as well because we have tree rings. And you'll see how we do that in just a minute. Stand structure. How does it break down as far as seedlings, saplings, and mature trees? All of this to better understand the successional trajectory of this particular forest and provide this information to whichever agency needs this information. I'm going to be keying in on Great Smoky Mountains National Park because that's where we have conducted a lot of our work on fire and shortleaf pine. <coughs> That this is uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. We're very fortunate. It took us years. It took us about five years to get an exception to the chainsaw use in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Had to go to Washington to do that. Finally, in 2005, we got permission to use the chainsaw in the National Park. We were very happy about this. That project ended in 2010. So what, everything you're going to see here was sampling done between 2005 and 2010, primarily on this west side over here. <coughs> 
Get my laser pointer. Mainly on the west side over here, this is the drier, more xeric site. This is dominated mainly by the yellow pines, uh, lots of oaks. It's a mixed, mixed hardwood forest, as you saw in, uh, in Bill Pickens' talk this morning. This is a dry, uh, this is where the shortleaf are primarily found. Everybody, everybody I think, has been to Cades Cove. If you haven't, you really need to. It's a central, uh, central tourism spot in Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Luckily, there are all kinds of trailheads that we can access to, to get to the shortleaf pines here on the western side, the more xeric side of Great Smoky Mountains National Park. If you zoom in a little bit here, you can see this portion, the, the drier side over here, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. These are, there's Cades Cove again right in there. And you can see it, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sites where we've gotten information on past fire from uh, specific to shortleaf pine. Now we've got eight sites and you're going, well that's not a lot, but you can't imagine how much work, field work and preparation goes into the collection of, this, of these sites. Just one site alone, with three sites will take up an entire summer. So this represents several summers worth of work. Uh, teams from University of Tennessee and Texas A&M were involved in this. And again, I mentioned that we had to break the paradigm that fire was just not very common here in the southeast. Well, it's true, it hasn't been common here in the southeast and since about 1925, uh, it's about 1925, 1935 or so. Okay, but let me tell you, it was actually very common before then. So we had to break that paradigm. But if you know what to look for, if you know what to look for, I bet every one of you have seen these. So again, I'm preaching to the choir. The evidence is out there. And, the, and this is all in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And this was kind of a revelation to them because you know there had been a previous study done in the early 1980s, didn't use Denver chronology. But we were just walking around. You can walk around any place in the western side of Great Smoky Mountains National Park or even in the highest elevations, the Red Spruce, Australia Fir community, you'll find fire scars. You'll find them. If you know what to look for, they are there. And I've been told by many reviewers of you know, manuscripts of mine that, oh, wait a minute, no, sorry, fire does not occur. It's not that common. Well, I'm sorry, but if you get you know, all this evidence right here, it's kind of hard to refute all of this evidence of fire right in here. These are all cat faces on fire scarred. These are all shortly, by the way, in the western side of Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Sometimes they're very old. This is just what's left of a shortly pine. One thing I want to point out here, you'll see this light green stuff in the background. That's our now encroaching eastern white pine, which is gonna, it's pretty much taking over uh, the western side of Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, I'm going to lead you into this, but um, the yellow pines are dying out. Um, as you heard in the first talk this morning, <laughs> the yellow pines, um, we're probably going to say goodbye to them in Great Smoky, National, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, all except for one species, and that's Virginia pine. This is, is a recent uh, dead, in fact, most of these little dead ones here, the ghost trees that you see here, that's southern pine beetle. Um, it just decimated the shortly pines on the western side of Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Ghost trees are still standing. Um, it's big ones. I mean, these are really spectacular. And th there's the evidence of fire. All of this, all these cat faces with the charcoal still in them. Um, these that have multiple ridges, I'll show you in just a minute, that indicate multiple fires occurred. Here we have just two spectacular snags. All the bark has fallen off this. This is about 2008 or so. And we just go in with a chainsaw and lop off the tops of these and get a cross section. Take it back to the laboratory. Here's the weird thing about southern pine beetle. Uh, dead tree here <laughs> and a living living tree right in there with both with cat faces on the uphill side of the tree which is where usually the cat, the cat faces will form so like I said if you know what to look for the evidence is there it's all over the place you, might, you don't, that that right there is on a trail that's right there on gold mine trail I mean literally I mean on the west side of the national park you don't even have to go very far in fact this is what clued us in that fire was very common here were trees that like this that were right there on the trail so what we do, and this is what I love, that I, the fact that I can actually, my primary tool for research is a chainsaw, love it. And that's that same sample that you saw on the previous slide right there. We just go in and if it's, these are, most of what we sample are dead and down stuff or dead and standing stuff. We'd be very, we're very careful about uh, standing dead trees, you know, cutting them down because they are still wildlife trees. Uh, here's that same tree you saw on the previous slide. There's, there it is with bark, this is about 2005 or so. Uh, recent dead, <clears throat> and this is uh, what it looks like in 2014. <laughs> you can actually see the change in my hair color to date this right in there. But this also is, uh, this was just fantastic. And we've taken so many field trips out there with Park Service, Forest Service personnel, state forestry agencies, uh, divisions of forest, to show the evidence. And this is not, well, I shouldn't say that. It's, it's off trail, but it's easy to get to and demonstrate that the evidence is there if you know what to look for. The big thing here for us is that once you sample all this, you're nowhere near a vehicle and you have to have a good team, a lot of students, <laughs> a lot of students who can help carry this stuff out. And um, believe it or not, these, these crews right here, boy, man, they, they love the fact that I use a chainsaw. And once I see that, oh, wow, you do fire history, yeah, sure, you're allowed to cut down trees for research. Well, we did for five years, but man, they were out there helping us and they absolutely love the fact 
that they were allowed to do this and help us. And so they actually did help us with, the, with some of the chainsaw work and they did help us, of course, with the carrying out of the samples on our, on our packs. Along the way, and this may interest you, uh, along the way at that place, this is actually the same place, Goldmine Trail, if you want to see some nice big trees. Well, it used to be there because most of them are dead now, but this is one of the few trees that did not suck them to the southern pine beetle. Uh, this was just a fantastic tree right off of Goldmine Trail. Uh, at the trailhead of Goldmine Trail, <clears throat> and uh, you didn't have to walk very far in to see this, and it was a, just a spectacular pine, and we cored this first in 2005. That gives you an idea of the size of it. It dated, the inside ring that we had was 1712. Okay, so this is in the 300-year age class. Um, this is, and we didn't even get near the pith because our, you see, I brought, brought a bore that was too short, so um, we were, it was probably easily late 1600s. And I should tell you that the oldest living shortly pine right now is uh, 1684. Uh, we saw it uh, still living in 2014, luckily. So we cored that in 2007 and it dated to, and it's, it's, it was the oldest shortly pine until an older one was found in West Virginia not too long ago, dates to about 300. 57 years. Unfortunately, the sad thing is that tree right there, which was just, I just took all these groups to that tree right there. Unfortunately, in 2014, when we went there with the park superintendent, you can't see him, but that's over him down here. Rob Klein, that's me and the park superintendent. That tree, spectacular tree that had been standing for 300 years is now down. Um, it just gave in. Any number of reasons why it's just down on the ground. And the root bowl was about 10 feet high, I jumped up on it. and. It, it, was, it was really sad to see these, these um, giants of the, of the forest, especially here in the, in the southeast, uh, come down like that. It was, for, it was for natural causes. It could have been wind, could have been anything. It, it was growing on a slope, as you can see over here, but um, it had been there for 300 years, and it is now down. <clears throat> to get this information, getting back to fire history, to get this information, you should know that we have to core a lot of trees. I mean, we do this in... Uh, one tenth hectare plots, about 1,000 square meters, and we do this for every fire history site, multiple plots, hundreds and hundreds of trees being cored to learn about the ages of these trees, get the establishment information, to learn about the successional trajectory, the stand composition changes over time, to get everything as much as we can. And we core a lot of trees, um, no matter what site we're doing, because we couple this with the information we're going to get from the fire scars, which I'll show you in just a minute, to learn about fire history. <clears throat> We get this back to the laboratory, and this is what we end up with. That is a shortleaf pine from Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, the one thing I want to point out here, and you'll see this in the graph coming up, basically the results, some of the results that we come up with to tell the Park Service or the Forest Service or whoever agency it is that's interested, that's interested, how, the big question is, how often did fires occur? Were there changes in the fire regimes over time? Why did these changes occur? This is the information we try to give them. Well, it comes from the trees, and here's some of the, as you can see right here, all these arrows point to a distinct fire scar, and keeping in mind that these fires were low intensity, ground hugging, you know, smoking things that didn't kill the trees like you see on TV happening all over California and Oregon and state of Washington, Idaho, whatever, right now. These were just low intensity fires. Scar the tree but not kill it multiple times. This one tree, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, yeah. Nine scars, this one tree recorded nine scars. That's 1804, way back in here. So this is a record of 20, uh, 19th century fires, by the way. That's about the year 1900 or so. This is the 20th century curl. Okay, that should raise some alarm bells. There's some major changes in the fire regimes, okay? So we have to ask ourselves, this is what we do now. It's like, what were the changes? Now this one tree just failed to record um, fires. I'll tell you right now that the big cutoff, the big switch is about 1934 here in the southeast when many of our national forests were established, when Great Smoky Mountains National Park was established, Great Smoky Mountains National Park was established, what do you do? You kick everybody out. All the people that were living in the park were told to leave, you know, so you remove, guess what, an ignition source. But this should tell you, that's an alarm. Fire is very common in the, in the 19th century, mainly, well, I'm not even gonna say yet. This is what the fire charts look like. This is what we give the agencies. This is just for three of our sites. This is for Goldmine Trail, Rabbit Creek Trail, Pine Mountain on the very, very western side of the National Park, about 100 trees, 100 trees. This was, uh, this was a lot of work to go into this one graph. Each one of these lines right here is a tree. Each one of these tick marks right there is a fire scar dated to its exact year of formation, no plus or minus to the exact year of formation. So what you're seeing here is that during the 19th century, there it is right there, keeping in mind that Cades Cove was occupied about 1819, 1820. Guess what? Boy, the fires really start kicking in there. In fact, whoa, if you look at all the composite from all these fires in here, the 19th century was just on fire. 
makes you wonder why it's called Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Because honestly, it's like, yeah, we go there, ooh, look at the beautiful fog, ooh, you know, fog going up slow. But heck no, in the 19th century, it was, that park was on fire. There were people all over the place. You know, fire was a management tool. You know, if you had livestock, what'd you do? You burned your pasture, you burned Cades Cove. You want to bring back certain, you know, forage, whatever. You wanted to keep pests away. You wanted to create uh, travel corridors. You wanted uh, to increase your hunting success. What'd you do? You burned the heck out of it. Okay. So there it is right there. Let me just point this out. 19th century, full of fires. Now, before then, keep in mind, there were fires occurring because guess what? Lightning was still occurring. This is not lightning causing all this. This is not lightning causing all this. Why? Because the last big fire is about right here, 1934 and that's when the Great Smoky Mountain National Park became a national park, and then very few fires after that. If anything, these, might, these are going to be related to lightning, so you can actually see right there. You remove humans, you change the fire regime. That's what happened here. This is not, this is all, because, because guess what? You don't just sit there with a light switch, or nature doesn't, with a light switch and go, hmm, 1934, I'm going to stop lightning fires. No, that did not happen. Uh-uh. We took humans out. And there it is right there. So very few fires in the latter part of the 20th century, and today very few fires still occurring in the 20th century. <clears throat> and we also see changes in our stand inventories. And this is the big mess. This is the big, big, big. And basically the changes in fire regimes, we're also seeing changes in the composition of these forests when the trees established. The trees established in 1925, and lots, in fact, the, the understory, like this, the, this is a, was supposed to be a pine oak savanna on the western side of that national park. Well, beginning about 1925, 1935, trees have just come in like you cannot believe. Trees have just come in, and the understory, there's now an understory that did not exist before um, of all kinds of hardwoods. And we're actually seeing a transition, especially to the fire intolerance. I mean, the fire intolerance are now coming back and occupying where the yellow pines used to be, because the yellow pines used to be there because of all the fire. You take fire out, other hardwoods, other species are going to come in, especially these, boy, red maple. You want to see what Great Smoky Mountains National Park is going to look like in the future, two species, eastern white pine and red maple. Red maple is everywhere. Now, it's also prolific cedar, we know that, but it's, it's, going, to, it's going to dominate, and there's lots and lots of research on that. In fact, they've kind of known, scientists have known over the past 25, 30 years or so, how these forests are transitioning, what's going to take over red maple, eastern white pine, black gum, eastern hemlock. Today we're seeing eastern hemlock, 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 growing in places, well before they were all killed, growing in places that they normally should not be. On top of Boat Mountain, we were finding hemlock seedlings encroaching up from the coves. Because guess what? There was no fire no longer keeping them restricted to the coves. Hemlocks on top of a mountain in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. But look at all these other studies. Essentially, our yellow pines are not regenerating. They're not coming back. There's no seedlings whatsoever, unless there was a burn there that Rob Klein and Great Smoky Mas National Park did a few years ago, and they're very proud of this because guess what? Yellow pines came back. Small plot. Took, took the superintendent out there to look at 2014. It's all Virginia pine. No short leaves, no pitches, nothing else, all Virginia. And I don't think they want to bring back Virginia. They want to bring back other yellow pines in addition to Virginia. Okay, Virginia's always going to be the one, you know, you burn it, it's going to come back. Okay, but take a look at this. So essentially what's called mesification is occurring today. These forests are transitioning to fire intolerance, different fuel matrix, you got all these different, <coughs> different, different, different. And so it makes you wonder, how do we manage this? We've got, we've got a forest that is in transition today. That's been transitioning actually for about the last 75, 80 years or so. But there's been a clear shift from yellow pine oak dominated in the savannas on the west side, what used to be savannas, to the more fire intolerant, shade tolerant, hardwood and conifer species. That's what's going to make up. Basically, the yellow pines are gone. The shortleaf are all dead. You know, the few pitches that were on the west side, they're all gone too, next to southern pine beetle. Fires today are less common, causing more fuels to build up. And I will tell you that this is a problem because as the fuels are building up, you're going, well, it's becoming mesified, you know, me it's becoming more mesic. Well, guess what? At the same time, you've got this prolif proliferation of ericaceous shrubs in the understory. We all know this. Why? We go to Great Smoky Mountains National Park. What do we see? What do we hike around? Oh, all that beautiful rhododendron. Oh, man. You want to see a shrub that can explode? Mountain laurel? Guess what? It dominates the understory now. So if a fire does break out, you're going, well, we got rid of all the, you know, the pine needle you know, understory, the, the duff layer and all that. Oh, well, guess what? Guess what? If a fire does break out, it's not, it's not going to be pretty. It really isn't. It's not going to be pretty. Restoration, keeping in mind 
This is the central goal of Great Smoky Mountains National Park and to conserve. This is going to be difficult. You want to bring back the yellow pine? How? And that's going to be a big question. I'm just wondering, how do you bring back an entire understory? And how do you account for the dense ericaceous shrubs now? And actually, it could be more detrimental to introduce fire back into these ecosystems, especially you know, because of the different species that we have there. This is, this is a quandary for Great Smoky, Nash, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. They know that fire existed there in the past, especially during the 20th, uh, 19th century, and even before then because of lightning and of course because of Native Americans. Fire was a part of it. These trees, these pines, these are yellow pines. They have evolved with fire. They have specific fire adapted traits. You don't get those specific fire adapted traits unless you have fire occurring with them. So final slide, take home message here. Take home message, fire was once dominant disturbance process up until about 1925 to 1945. Climate itself cannot explain the increase in fires after 1800, nor the decrease and cessation of fires about 1925, 1935 or so. If it was, then fires would be occurring today. Fires are not occurring today. A few sporadic lightning caused fires, mainly in single tree events are occurring in Great Smoky, Mountain, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Some uh, fires have been lit, of course, by humans accidentally, campfires. So what's different today? Most fires in the record that we're looking at were caused by human ignitions. And of course, we removed humans from these environments, especially in the National Park, beginning about 1925 to 1945. So it may be, this is an alternate hypothesis, it may be that today's forests are just reverting back to what they used to be before these human-caused ignitions became common. Even though these forests are thought to be undergoing mesification and fire intolerant tree species are becoming more common, I still have to reiterate the fact that any fires that are lit now, especially in these dense understories dominated by ericaceous air shrubs, could actually be detrimental. And I should point out that soil charcoal studies, this is one of the big advances in, in understanding fire history, is to look at the charcoal in the soil. We found out that these mesic site conifers, eastern white pine, have actually been in these stands, these yellow pine stands, for the last 10,000 years. So that was a revelation to us. Yeah. That's all I've got. I hope you enjoyed my talk, and I'll be glad to answer any questions if we have time.